Oh, oh God. What do you think The Lighthouse is about? Go see the movie, <laughs> lazy bum. I did it. Do I have to explain it? Just watch it and you figure it out. I'm uh, Willem Dafoe, and Esquire has asked me to explain a few things. Let's go. The internet is obsessed with this photo. Can you explain it, please? Yes, I can. I did this movie called Inside, and I'm trapped in this house, and there's all these paintings and uh, objects because the guy's an art collector, among other things. The owner of the building. I'm a art thief, and I get trapped in there, and I can't get out. And there were these sculptures, which were oranges. They were very realistic. They looked like rotten fruit. And there was also a sculpture of a half-smoked cigarette. So the artist asked me if I could take a photo with them. So I did it. It's a simple thing. And the little bum put it on the internet. First of all, it looked like I was smoking. And second of all, it looked like I had a thing about rotten oranges, which I don't particularly. <laughs> Then people started playing with it and it turned into a meme. You know, they started putting different things in my hand, different things in my mouth. I mean... It got a little wacky. That damn internet. You're happy to have people play with your image, but sometimes it's not so nice. How would you describe the Willem Dafoe drip? The drip thing, that had to be described to me. I didn't know what drip was. Do I have a personal style? I don't think I do. I'm a blank slate. You know, I'm interested in clothes to the degree that clothes, you know, I'm an actor. I appreciate clothes. I appreciate them mostly. Uh, other people's clothes. But for me, uh, yeah, I, I, I value clothes because they're a kind of costume and I value costumes because they can really affect uh, how you work and uh, I appreciate what they can do. But personally, I, I didn't, don't want to take the time thinking about what to wear. So maybe that's my style, that I don't quite think about it and I bounce around so my personal style is all full of things. All, all full of contradictory things. Hey, you guys, let's go down to Crambo's and get a drink from the bubbler. What is the most challenging accent you have ever tried? I don't know, but one thing's interesting is I speak Italian. No, sono molto felice. La storia di questo premio è molto... I can't do a good Italian accent. Maybe it's out of respect. I don't know. Beside the really broad uh, Chico Marx one. I can't do it. Maybe I'll learn one day. Which of your characters would you most want to have a meal with and why? You know, Jesus. I know there's going to be a nice glass of wine, a nice, <laughs> a nice loaf of bread. That's okay. Who I wouldn't want to have it with is uh, oh, probably Bobby Peru from Wild at Heart. He'd be eating fast food. Very fast food. Okay, the cat's out of the bag. You know, Mark, he's brilliant in this movie. And when we were rehearsing, he kept on belly aching about, oh, I'm, I'm, I feel, I don't know, it's it too much. Maybe I'm not right for this. And he was just, I think, reaching for reassurance. And we were happy to give it to him to a degree. But I thought, oh, man, let's, let's give this guy a good little scare. Oscar Isaac was shooting at another part of the studio where we were in Budapest. And uh, Mark one day said, I saw Oscar Isaacs here. Is, is like here, he, 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 he here to replace me? I said, oh, no, 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 don't be silly. And the next day, since I knew Oscar because I had worked with him, I said, come over. And he came over at lunch and we staged this little scene like he had come to tell Mark that it was over and he was taking over. But that lasted for about a second. But it was a good joke, yeah? Good practical joke. Whose decision was it for you to go to mortician school? It's not really mortician school. We had a wonderful teacher, this young woman who was the head person at the mortuary in Budapest, where we were shooting. And she uh, took uh, Rami Youssef and myself and taught us how to suture, also flay flesh, also uh, gave us instruction about how to do um, certain things about autopsies. But she was very cool. And the thing that I loved about her is she, she worked all the time. And every second that she didn't work, she was a gamer. So she's Louise, think about that. A woman that works in the mortuary in the rest of her time, 
all she does is get behind the computer and play all these uh, virtual games. Wow. What did you do to pass the time in the makeup chair? We're talking about poor things, uh, long makeup preparation, four hours in, two hours out. You meditate. <laughs> you can't really sleep because you've got to cooperate with them because the pieces are some, sometimes quite small. Uh, your call is usually three o'clock in the morning. So you try to turn it into a good thing. It helps you get into character, certainly, because you recede and the character comes forward as you're looking in the mirror. But meditation, meditation, meditation. Why did you volunteer to let Emma Stone slap you? Listen, you try to be there for the other actor. <laughs> This isn't in um, poor things. It's in the kinds of kindness. It's just gotten a new title. But there was a scene and she had a very long monologue. And right before the monologue, She slaps me. And I felt like she'd do much better. She'd get a much better start on the speech if she could slap me rather than miming it. And she was down with that. She said, thank you very much. But we did the speech many, many times. But I'm a big boy. I can take it. Um, anytime you get a chance to help out, it's a gift to yourself. You know what I'm saying? Can you explain this connection? Batman and Beetlejuice. I did a role of Beetlejuice, too. And uh, I'm excited to see it. I don't want to say too much about it. And years ago, in the original Batman, there was some, and to be fair, I hate these stories where actors say, I almost paid, or they wanted me to play, but it didn't happen. You know, those are terrible stories. And half of them are not true. But I heard rumors that they were interested in me uh, for playing Batman. I was younger then. Maybe I was more handsome then. I don't know. You think I could have been Batman? <laughs> I think so. But it wasn't meant to be, and that's fine. Batman went fine without me, and I am fine. I did not die without that role. Are there any other villains you would want to play? No, I don't think like that. I don't think about roles so much. I think about situations. I think about people to work with. I think about adventure. I'm into going from not knowing to jumping into an adventure. That's, those are always the most beautiful experiences for me. So, nope. But on the other hand, bring it on. I'll play another villain. What do you remember most from shooting Platoon? Ah, Platoon was a really rich experience, so I think of many things. Uh, you know, I went there when there was a revolution, and my plane was the last plane in. And I had flown from New York to Manila, and I took a little nap because it's a long flight. And I was in a high-rise hotel, and I opened the bird drapes, and I saw tanks going down the street. Then, shortly after, I got a phone call from one of the producers. They were like, sit tight, the movie's canceled, we'll get you out when we can. <laughs> They had expelled all Westerners the week before. So I was uh, a gringo at the center of this uh, fairly bloodless people power revolution. And I was with them out on the street. And it was a real exhilarating uh, experience because the people felt their power. It was a really uh, great time for me. You've worked with Wes Anderson five times. Is your opinion what makes him such a great filmmaker? You know, he has vision. He sees things. He can articulate certain feelings that are very specific. He's fun to work with because he's so precise. And when he asks you to do something, he's playing with what he sees, you know, your essences. So then once he kind of frames you, usually it's a pretty good setup because he's not a madman. He sees something there and then you lean into it and sometimes it's pretty amusing. Did you ever spend a night at the Magic Castle Inn? Yes, I did. I lived there pretty much. I mean, actually, I'd go home usually and I'd stay at a nice hotel because you got to be in top form when you're making movies. But the whole thing was we were spending all our time there and the people that were living at the motel where we made the Florida Project, we were learning how to do the movie from them because we were watching them. We didn't want to interpret their life. We wanted to be a part of their life. So we were an extension of what they were doing. And that was the cool thing. So it's very rooted and it's very hard to make a movie that doesn't have a sense of reality or isn't truthful or doesn't have a personal stake when you're with the people because you come to love them and you come to respect them and you want to represent them well, even if it's not always a flattering portrait, at least make it true. So you're not making something that's, you know, bullshit. 
What was the audition process for Last Temptation of Christ? Ah, very interesting. I had heard about this movie. They were auditioning everybody and their brother. They didn't see me. They didn't want to talk to me. They weren't interested in me. Fine. What can I do about that? And then one day, I get a call, and they say, Mark Scorsese wants to talk to you. And uh, I say, what's he want to talk to me about? Uh, Last Temptation of Christ. And I say, cool. What, what role? They say, you idiot, for Christ. And I'm like, really? That's not a great idea. And then I said, send me the script, and I'd lo- of course I'd love to talk to him. So I read the script, and then I got it. I thought, oh, I get it. Yes, I should play this role. And I went in, we talked, I said yes. I loved that he saw that I was the guy to do it, and it was a beautiful experience. And I think it's, uh, you know, as much as you can be in love or not in love with your movies, it, it's a beautiful movie. How does it feel to be back to the horror for the first time since Shadow of the Vampire? Well, a lot of people say I've visited the horror a lot, <laughs> a lot since then. But um, labels are tricky. One man's horror is another man's. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's kind of a ending with a whimper. I wish we had one more to really kick it off, but that's what editing's for, folks. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs>